so good to see all of your faces. You guys truly are family to me. I, the last few months have really felt just a lack without your presence in my life, getting to see you guys together. Um, to those of you watching online or on CCTV, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, it's such a team effort to be here together this morning. The staff worked super hard as a team to make it possible for us to gather here and worship. And then we get to continue that team effort as a church body as we're together. And that is by sitting how you're sitting, kind of far apart, and just abiding by some little guidelines that'll help us just feel safe and relaxed. And um, we have to trust each other, right? When we come and be together and worship as a church, we trust each other, we trust the staff, we trust the system. So thanks for taking a risk and trusting people and being here today. We're just so glad to have you. So a couple little um, housekeeping guidelines. You guys are experts on these because we've been doing this for a few months. But just a reminder to keep your mask on at all times when you're inside. Um, cool thing about a mask is if you're getting sleepy, it's harder to tell if you're falling asleep. If you have like not a smile, nobody knows. Like, I don't know. There's something, it feels like I'm wearing costumes sometimes. And sometimes I feel like get a little more silly when I'm wearing a mask. So you get to have that experience this morning while we're here. And uh, the second thing is just make sure you're maintaining social distancing between each other sitting like you're sitting right now in household groupings. Um, if you wanna get social and catch up with people, we invite you to do that outside. We kind of set up space out in the grass for you to go out and talk to each other and um, just make sure we're being really respectful of that. Thank you for registering to be here today. Um, you can do that online, you can call the church or you can do it on the app and um, oh, falling down. Um, we encourage you to do that each Sunday as well, just so that we can know how many to anticipate for and um, plan for. Um, so pretty easy, right? Those are, those are our things we ask of you. So grateful to have you guys here this morning. Let's worship together. I invite you guys to stand with us this morning if you would. Troubles, 
But until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Let that be your prayer this morning. I can see the light, and I can see the light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes. Still I will praise you, still I will praise you. We're singing, oh no, you never let go, through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go, every high and every low. my soul Oh resurrection power burns like fire in my heart when orders rise I lift my eyes up to your throne We are more than conquerors through Christ You have the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I will sing into the night, Christ is risen and on night, greater is He living in me than in the We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over despair. You are the hope. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. Victorious in your name, you are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible. Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. And you are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. Because nothing Every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious, and you are stronger than our hearts. You are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious.
You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning. Great to be with you today and to be together. Uh, let's just give the, the band one more round of applause. That was just, it's great to be in this space and just singing some praises. Songs of hope really, uh, really means a lot. I'm going to go get my podium here. Hold on. Dwayne, you're letting me down, bro. You're letting me down. Take back all that clapping we just did for you. Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. We like to have fun together. It's all good. Well, uh, we're trying a new experiment this week. We're speaking with a mask. So believe me, I am smiling underneath here when I'm looking at you. If, Like Katie said earlier, if you get too tired or the sermon bores you, just move back over your eyes and you can take a nice nap, right? So we've been in this series called All Things New. And it's been a great, it's been a great series for us to explore together, to explore God's heart of restoration. We've talked a lot about a place called heaven But today, I get the dubious honor of talking about the other place. You know, the H-E double hockey sticks? That place? So we're going to talk a little bit about hell today. Hell. What do you think about when you hear the word hell? (laughs) Someone said marriage. (laughs) Oh, wow. This is dark. This is dark. Well, we... One of the first things... I'll tell you a funny story that comes to my mind. When I was a youth pastor when I first got into ministry. I had this idea of what I could take the youth group to do. We were going to go and play paintball. How many paintball fans out there? Anybody play paintball? Two people. All right. So we went to this, uh, I booked this place that was a paintball company. They had their own field and everything. And they were located in this town called Hell. It's a place, Hell, Michigan. In the first service, someone was here that's actually been to Hell which was, you know, that was great. I felt accepted. Well, you can imagine as a youth pastor how much fun I had with that bulletin announcement. Next week, the youth group goes to hell. Sign up here. It was a, I had a lot of fun with that, let me tell you. Well, that was just a, kind of a funny story of that, of what I think about when I think about the word hell. But to be honest, hell can be a divisive topic in the church. <laughs> Shock, isn't it amazing? People think different things about something so divisive. But today I want to talk about this in a very court street way, which we believe is an open-handed way and an open-hearted way. And this is what I mean. What our approach to doctrine at Court Street is this. In essentials, we have unity. In non-essentials, we have liberty. And in all things, we have love. We have love. And really, even though the doctrine of hell would really be one of those things that kind of fits in the category of a non-essential, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's not important. It is important. We find the topic of hell in the scripture, and so we want to talk about that, but we want to talk about it in this way. Because what we believe about hell, what we believe about the future, certainly has an effect on our actions today. I'm going to take a little bit of a risk and be vulnerable with you guys today and those of you who are joining us on Facebook and CCTV as well and tell you this, the idea of hell was a difficult one for me. I'll tell you why. My earliest images of hell were brought to me through the television. There were these Christian movies in the 70s that depicted hell as this fiery place where people were just like in torture all the time. And I remember pastors getting behind the pulpit and preaching, 
hellfire and brimstone messages. Maybe you've heard some of those where, you know, if you didn't say the right prayer or you weren't baptized in the right way or you didn't do exactly as the church taught on this, then you better be careful. You might risk being thrown into this, you know, place that's unimaginable and having eternal torture. And as a pastor, as I begin my professional, you know, life as a pastor, I begin teaching and preaching on the love of God. And I found it increasingly difficult for myself to believe in this idea of a loving God who has this, you know, amazing rest, restorative plan for our life. And this idea that I heard sometimes growing up is that God will throw people into hell. That you know, doesn't really fit for me. And I don't know if any of you have been in that boat. You, you think some of the same thoughts. I was actually sharing this story with a pastor that I once worked with. And I was telling him the, you know, how it was difficult for me to, to justify these two things. And this pastor told me, I totally understand where you're coming from. I've had some of the same thoughts myself, but I would just be careful sharing that with anyone. And I'm like, why, why would I be careful sharing that with anyone? Because it can be quite threatening, apparently, if you teach something different about that. So rather than try to teach you all these things about hell as uh, definites, I want to tell you the story of hell. Can I do that this morning? And we can all be on the same page. So in your notes, take that out. And we're going to tell, we're going to talk about the story of hell. Now what I mean is how hell has been developed in our culture, how it's been developed in the church, and how it's been developed really in scripture. And we're going to take a look at this with, with kind of some fresh eyes. You may be shocked to hear this next statement come out of my mouth. The word hell is not in the Bible. Now, you might think, wait, wait a second, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to Google that right now, you know. Yes, the word hell, H-E-L-L, is in the Bible, but it's an English word that's been used by translators to translate many different words that are actually found in Scripture. And that's what I want to look at in our notes there. So let's go back to the ancient times. Let's go back to when the Jewish people, what we understand of ancient times, of course, we have in the scripture in the Old Testament. What did people believe about the afterlife? What did they believe about hell? Well, a good example of this is found in Psalms chapter 16, verse 10. And we're going to go back to the earliest translation of the English Bible, the King James Version. And look at this verse with me, if you would. Psalm 16, verse 10 says this, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. A lot of these and thous here. But what does the author mean when he says that word, hell. The word there actually is a specific Hebrew word, and the word is sheol. Sheol, and what sheol literally means is the grave. The grave. So that's in your notes, the first thing. You see, in Jewish thought, the idea of sheol was that, let me back up, the idea in Jewish thought was that at the end of your life, the end of it was just the grave, that you died and you were buried, and that was it. And so over and over in the Old Testament, if you read in the King James Version, you'll read quite a few times that hell was used to translate sheol. But literally what it means is the grave. A better, more modern translation of that would be this. Look at this. Let's look at this verse again uh, by modern translators. Here it is side by side. And this will make sense to you. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. Boy, that, does, that changes the meaning, doesn't it, to us? Because the idea was the author of this scripture was actually resting in the hope that God would be with him, even to the point of death. That gives me a lot of hope, especially when I, I do services for people who, uh, you know, funeral services, people that have died. To be able to say, God is with you, even to the grave. So let's go forward to starting to get into you know, more uh, down the road here in our timeline, we have 800 to 400 BC. We have beginnings of Greek thought influencing culture and also influencing scripture. We have people like Homer who wrote the Iliad, or we have Greek philosophers, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and they introduced this new idea that 
the, you know, the ancient people didn't believe that the body and soul was separate. They thought it was just all one. But the Greeks begin this new idea. They say, well, we have two parts of us. We have our body and we have our soul. And after man or woman dies, this soul goes to another place. And the word that the Greeks had was the word place of the dead. The Greek place of the dead. There was no separation between good people or bad people. Hades was just where you went, your soul went, after you died. Well, this philosophy of Greek uh, thought had a tremendous effect on all of culture, including the culture of the early days when Jesus was alive. In fact, the Pharisees um, adapted the idea of Hades into their theology. And they, they started kind of this idea that there was this place where good people went and a place where bad people went. And of course, the good people were the ones who followed their teaching. So they had this idea um, that influenced their theology. Well, so let's go to the person of Jesus. Because if you read through the Gospels, Jesus uh, talks about the afterlife. And it's translated hell. People will say, well, Jesus taught about hell. Here's a great example of that. Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, where Jesus says this. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. What did Jesus mean by that? Well, the word that Jesus uses when he talks about, when you see the word hell in your New Testament, there's a word that Jesus is using. It's an Arabic word, and it's the word Gehenna. And Gehenna means the city dump. So remember when Jesus was teaching during his time, he would use illustrations that were on, happening in his day to illustrate this greater truth about God. And so Jesus used this place that was actually a place during his time called Gehenna. And what it was was a valley in Jerusalem a valley in Jerusalem that was the city dump. And in Gehenna, they would keep the fires burning. There was always smoke. There was always fire because they were throwing the refuse there. Sometimes they would throw the bodies of, of dead animals into Gehenna. They never threw any living beings in Gehenna. Everything was dead. The only people that were ever thrown in Gehenna were the criminals of the day that they didn't believe had a right to a proper burial. So they would bury, they would throw their dead bodies into Gehenna. Can you imagine this place? It seems like a horrible place, but the people of the day understood that. And so what Jesus was saying was that he, he was referring to the Pharisees' teaching that God would actually is the one who can destroy both soul and body. He was using an idea, a belief that they already had in their head, and he was illustrating that. Well, let's go on. Beyond the time of Jesus, we have around 60 to 90 AD, which was a very influential time in Christianity because that's when most of Scripture was being written. We have people like Paul and Peter and the Apostle John who are writing about the end times and final judgment. And when you, hear, when you read Paul's uh, writings on end times and final judgment, understand this. Paul was writing to people who were being persecuted. He was trying to give them hope. He was saying that the people that are persecuting you uh, will one day receive their judgment. But it's interesting in Paul's writings, especially 2 Thessalonians, there's no indication that this judgment will be something that lasts forever and ever, but it will be a one-time judgment and then it's done. There's another word, it's the last thing in your notes, and it's in 2 Peter. 2 Peter, Peter uses a word in 2 Peter 2, verse 4. It's a Greek word, Tartarus. And Tartarus means a holding cell for Satan and his angels. A holding cell for Satan and his angels. So if we look at this verse together, this will make more sense to you. Let's look at the actual text. It says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, this is Tartarus, putting them in chains of darkness to be held for judgment. 
Peter's not talking about a place for human beings. He's talking about a place that's reserved for Satan and for his angels. And the image is of a holding cell. The last thing I want to talk about in Scripture during this time is, is the Apostle John. And the last book of your Bible is this very mysterious and quite scary book, sometimes called Revelation. And in this revelation, John receives an apocalyptic vision, which apocalypse, apocalypse literally means God unveils something, and, he, and John is able to see something that he wasn't able to see before. And in this vision that John has, he sees something called the lake of fire. And what is this? What is the lake of fire? Well, it's actually, John is using the same word that Jesus used, Gehenna. He was referring to a place that the people of the day would understand, that would help them understand God's final judgment. And here's the deal about Scripture. A lot of this is, a lot of this is mysterious, quite honestly. I don't know anyone who's been to, to hell and back. I don't really understand fully what it is, but I know from Scripture that it gives us different types of ways of understanding. Things like imagery, metaphor, uh, allegory, even apocalyptic visions from John to give us these images of heaven and hell. And really what it does, it allows us to use our imaginations. To use our imaginations. Well, let's continue this story of hell and how it was developed in the church. Around 400 AD, there comes a man named Augustine. And Augustine is a great church leader. And he has, he's, he has a lot of thoughts on theology and starts developing the theology of the church. And one of the ideas that he has uh, bringing about an eternal punishment is purgatory. Perhaps you've been around a church or, or been involved in a church that has taught purgatory. This idea came from Augustine. As the church continues to development, there's another influential uh, writer of the time. His name is Dante. We know him as. And he wrote this book. Actually, it was part of a trilogy of books called The Inferno. And if you've ever looked at The Inferno or know anything about it, I'll tell you the brief idea is Dante imagined hell as nine different levels or nine different circles that went down to the the center of the earth, per se. And it was based on how good or how bad you were in this life as to what level of hell you would go to. Some of them are weren't that bad quite honestly they were some of them were kind of pleasant but this idea of hell and being at the center of the earth was something that had tremendous influence on the early church in 1500 AD of course you have the great reformation of the church and reformation leaders they bring their ideas about hell and then we come to a very specific date for all you history nerds you're loving this but if you're you're feeling your eyes roll back in your head we're almost there we come to this very specific date, and it's July 8th, 1741. We have this man named Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards is a Puritan preacher, and he's a, he's a staunch Calvinist, and he preaches a famous sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Perhaps you've heard it. And in this sermon, he paints an image of an angry God who absolutely detests his creation. Look at this quote from the sermon. Jonathan says, The God that holds you over the pit of hell, much as one holds a spider or a loathsome insect over the fire. Whew. I mean, that just gives me the eebie jeebies a little bit, you know, to think about uh, what that kind of God that Jonathan Edwards presented. So it's this image God is a wrathful, all powerful dictator who, uh, that influences preachers who begin to preach messages known as we know today as like doom and gloom or uh, hellfire and brimstone, these type of ideas to try and scare people away from a life of hell and scare them into a life with God. That sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> it sounds like a good time, right? Maybe some of you grew up in that type of environment. There was some of that in my environment, Definitely. And maybe some of you still ascribe to some form of that type of thinking or that type of theology. Well, let me just kind of put everyone at ease here and just say this. I, my purpose today is not to tell you what to believe about hell because there are many different ideas of what hell looks like and what that is. My purpose today is to bring about a sense of hope in your life. Uh, maybe a different perspective, if you would, 
You know, if this story of hell that I've been talking about, I've just given kind of a brief overview of it, but if it piques your interest and you would love to be able, in your own mind, be able to come to a place where you understand what hell might mean for you, um, we have some great resources here. I have some great resources. I'd love to point you in that direction um, to help you with that. But what I hope to give you today is, is a different perspective because there's a saying that I, that I love to think about when it relates to anything like this, anything uh, in life or scripture or God, and it's this. What you focus on, you will find. And if you focus on an image of God as an angry, vindictive God, then you're going to find a certain way of thinking. But if you focus on God as a loving God who really cares and has a plan of restoration... That leads you in a different direction. And I don't know about you, but that just seems to be more compelling to me. To think of a different focus on who God is. Because in the deepest parts of my being, I believe, want to believe that there's a better way. And I believe that the better way is the image of God that I know of. Rather than punishment of hell, the image of God is the invitation to follow Jesus to know God and experience God's love. If the Bible is this grand story that leads in a in a certain way of not not in a story that says everything's going to be destroyed, but everything is going to be restored, boy, that just gives me a different idea. And that really is found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who loved the unlovable. Jesus was the one who operated by different rules of the day, quite frankly. Jesus was the one who was willing to show the love of God to the point of the cross. To give his life so that all of creation, which includes us, could be rescued from sin, could be rescued from death, could be rescued even from the grave. So if we focus on the image of of God as restoring all things, where does that lead us with this idea of hell? This is the next part of your notes. Okay, let's dig into this real quick. Number one, this focus says that rather than fear, God gives love. Rather than fear, God gives love. The way hell has been presented for so many years has been in this fearful way. It's been in a way that tries to motivate people like do this, don't do that, or else you go to hell. And that, honestly, is not a very good motivation. It doesn't motivate for true heart change. Fear can be one of the most crippling things in life, quite frankly. (laughs) And we certainly understand that in today's culture, in today's time. Fear has has, uh, kind of crippled our culture in the in the place where we don't really know what to believe. We're like, oh, what, what do I believe about this, or what do I believe about that? And it just puts me in a place where I'm just stuck or I'm living in a place of anxiety. Fear is a really great tactic to sell a magazine or a book or a TV show or a news story. Yet the story of God gives a bigger motivation, a better motivation than fear. Let's look at 1 John. This is the guy who wrote Revelation. And I love what he says. As we live in God... Our love grows more perfect, so we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. The love of God is something that we're growing into at all times, And it's bringing us to a place of restoration is what John is saying. It's bringing us closer to God, to his heart of love and restoration rather than the heart of fear and destruction. Fear is debilitating. Fear causes within us an us versus them mentality. And fear brings out the worst parts of ourselves. But the way of love, the way of Jesus is really liberating. And nothing is more liberating but knowing and living into the idea that you are fully and completely 
loved and accepted like we have in Jesus. The second thing is rather than vengeance, God gives grace. Rather than vengeance, God gives grace. So in contrast to this message that God is an angry old man bent on revenge for the sin of the world, God's heart is for something much bigger, actually, and much more challenging to accept for us, and that's grace. We are always in a state of like understanding and growing in what it means to accept God's grace and to live that out. Paul says in Ephesians that in order that in the coming ages, God might show the incomparable riches of God's grace. So in, uh, he says, this is, this is what you've got to look forward to. God is going to continue to unveil his grace expressed in God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It's a gift of God. God's gift to us is not one of punishment, but God's gift to us is grace. Uh, I love the bigger picture of justice, of justice being that God is working toward an otherworldly grace. As I was preparing this, I, this question came to my mind, and maybe this will mean something to you. Am I more concerned about the punishment of others, or am I more captivated by the mystery of limitless grace? Very personal question to think about. When I think about hell, Am I more concerned about punishment of others or am I more concerned about the mystery of God's limitless grace? Hmm. The third thing is this. Rather than condemnation, God honors choice. God honors our choice. So when we think about hell, what if we think about it from this way? You know, God made me. God made me a free being with a free choice. God loves me but God does not make me love him back. Gives me the choice to be able to do that. And that's the nature of love, isn't it? Anyone who's ever been in love knows that you can't make another person love you. They have to freely choose that of their own self. And so God, in this great mystery of who God is, chooses to love and then allows creation to choose that same love for God back. I love this uh, quote from Tim Mackey, who is uh, one of the leaders of the Bible Project out of Portland, great Bible teacher, and he says this definition of hell. Hell is about God honoring our decision for a life and identity apart from God. Hmm. If, uh, If loving God is a choice, then as well as hell is a choice, is what he's saying. The fourth thing is this, as we think about our focus on hell in this, rather than destruction, God gives restoration. Rather than destruction, God gives restoration. Do you find yourself um, in a place where you're kind of enamored by stories of horror and punishment? (laughs) It's kind of hard not to if I flip through, you know, the movies to watch on Netflix. Boy, there's some really... uh, amazing movies that focus on this idea of horror and punishment. Maybe it's our own internal sense of justice that we, maybe in our lives, we have been hurt by someone so deeply that we just have this focus. We just want to see them get, you know, punishment for what they did to us. That's what we would love to do. We would love to see that. But God's idea of justice is actually bigger than just reward and punishment. God's idea of justice is this restoration. Jesus talked about this heart of God in Matthew 19, 28, which is really the the theme verse when we've been using for this series is Jesus says, at the renewal of all things, speaking of the kingdom of God coming, he's, he's talking about God is working toward renewing everything toward uh, himself. The way that we talk about this often here at Court Street is choosing to live the with God life. The with God, choosing to live this life with God rather than apart with him. Because that's the kingdom of heaven is choosing to live uh, daily with God. Kingdom of hell could be the opposite, right? Choosing to not live that kingdom life. 
I love this picture of C.S. Lewis, uh, this quote from C.S. Lewis. This helps, helps me kind of understand uh, what hell might look like as well. He said, we must picture hell as a state where everyone is perpetually concerned about his own dignity and advancement. Oof, pause on that for a minute. <laughs> where everyone has a grievance and where everyone lives in the deadly serious passions of envy, self-importance, and resentment. Wow. If you uh, look at that, it, it definitely seems like the times we're living in today, doesn't it? The hell is this choice that we have to either live for ourselves or uh, heaven is a choice to live in this kingdom of God, in this kingdom of heaven that Jesus was talking about. And we participate that. We can participate in that right now by loving God and loving people. And that's really the, the, the theme that we've been kind of beating here at the church is that Jesus calls us to this life of, of living the kingdom of heaven now and bringing heaven to earth by living the, the love of Jesus uh, toward God and toward others as well. Earlier in this, in this sermon, I told you guys a story about the place that Jesus talked about when he talked about hell. He was talking about the word, what is, what is the word? Gehenna. There you go. Okay, good. So Jesus was talking about Gehenna, and he was talking about this, this place where it was filled with fire and smoke and burning refuse and even some burning dead bodies. I, I can't imagine what that would have smelled like. Well, Gehenna is still a place today, actually. If you go to Jerusalem, you can go to this place. It's called uh, the Valley of Hinnom. The Valley of Hinnom. And this is what Gehenna, or the Valley of Hinnom, looks like today. I don't see any smoke. I don't see anything burning. In fact, what I see are paths where you can take your family for a walk or beautiful trees and grassy areas. People like to go to the Valley of Hinnom today to go rock climbing. (laughs) In other words, Gehenna is a place that's been restored. The place that Jesus talked about now looks completely different. And for me, this is a picture of God's restoration in our lives. That God can take something, even that Jesus talked about 2,000 years ago, that was a horrible place, and make it into something new. How much more is God working toward restoration in our own lives and what that means? I don't have to live. In other words, I don't have to live in this fear of hell. I can live in the restoration of God in my life. I can live into the love and the grace and the beauty that God has for me. In 1 John 4, 17 and 18, the verse that we live, now this will really pop to you, I think. It says, as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment, but we can face God with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. And such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of love that I want to live into. That's the kind of love that I want to be a part of my life. That's the way that I want to focus on God and focus on his kingdom. Let's pray together, and then Katie's going to come, has a couple of announcements, but let's, let's say a prayer together. God, I just want to say thank you for this, for this message on hell this morning and how it's impacted my, my heart and mind as I've been thinking about and studying for it. It's this beautiful picture, actually, of restoration, somehow in the mystery of it all. I don't really know, but God, you're working to restore uh, all of our lives to you. You're working to restore uh, this earth to you. And I pray that we would, we would focus on that. We focus on your love, that we would focus on your grace, and that we would focus on living a life uh, without fear because Jesus has done it all. God, thank you for this, this day that we've been able to gather and worship. We certainly uh, love being with you and uh, being with you together as well. In Jesus' name, everyone said, amen. amen. Thanks for being here today, everybody. Okay, we're so glad we got to worship with you guys this morning. And for those of you watching online, we hope that you join us again next week. We'll be here again next week, you guys. I hope you come on back. Um, For those of you here...